Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ross Wiener from the Aspen Institute's Education and Society program. Uh, and we're delighted uh, to have uh, this distinguished panel and to have you join us this morning for the release of these three uh, new reports. So, and the, the reports, you should each have a copy on your, uh, on your chair, and we've got some extra copies if you need them on your way out. Just a little bit of context, uh, and then I'll introduce our panelists and we'll get into the discussion. Um, at the Aspen Institute's Education and Society program, we, we run a network of urban superintendents and then some others on their leadership teams, and we try to facilitate the urban school districts learning from each other uh, and learning from leading efforts in the field. And so to support those networks, uh, we try and sort of keep our eye on what's going on out in the field and to bring some of those uh, so some of the leading efforts into that work. And that's where the profiles that we're releasing today were initially produced to support discussions in the Urban Superintendents Network. Um, and we certainly found that uh, the work that's going on in DC public schools uh, has a lot to teach. So many urban school districts in the country right now are wrestling with the issues of teacher evaluation uh, and building stronger human capital systems. Um, and the work in DC has been uh, very thoughtful and strategic and focused and we were really uh, very lucky to have DCPS be willing to sort of put their work under a microscope um, and allow for it to support a deep conversation with the urban superintendents and indeed another conversation with the chief <coughs> academic officers uh, from those school districts. We also in the same meeting with those superintendents uh, released or produced a profile of the uh, human capital work in the Achievement First Charter School Network. It's a high performing charter school network located in Connecticut and New York, uh, and really uh, provides both some interesting contrasts um, with DCPS, and, and also actually uh, you'll see some interesting similarities in the issues that they confront. And I think we chose these two systems actually in part to give the sort of fullness of, of the work right now. DCPS is really trying uh, some ambitious, comprehensive reforms in a system that really didn't have a, a culture around performance management. Achievement first, had a sort of more holistic um, marriage of accountability and support already and is actually trying to take that work to the next level. And so trying to, to be able to learn from both of these systems. I mean, it's unbelievable how much our field is trying to innovate right now. Uh, everybody seems consumed with the need to develop new teacher evaluation systems, new human capital policies in lots of ways. And so again, we think it's really important to make sure that as everybody is trying to do new work at the same time, we actually learn uh, from that work. Um, and so um, we wrote these profiles, and, and I'll introduce Rachel Curtis in just a minute at the end of the panel, who actually is the author of the profiles, uh, really with a system leader's perspective in mind. So you know, as you go into these profiles, you'll see a lot of focus on process and sequence and the kinds of decisions the systems had to confront, just as much focus on those issues as on sort of final decisions or outcomes. <coughs> Um, again, we're really honored that these systems have shared their experiences with us. We're delighted that they're here to share them with you today. And so let me then uh, introduce the panelists uh, we have and then we'll, we'll get into it. Um, and when they're done, we're hoping we'll have a significant amount of time for questions. So um, when we do turn to questions, uh, if you'll raise your hand, I'll try and identify folks and please do wait for the microphone to come around. We're actually webcasting. Uh, and videotaping today's panel discussion, uh, and so we need for the microphone to be there for, for everyone to be able to hear uh, what you're asking. And last, uh, last piece of housekeeping before we get into the content, um, there's actually another event that's going to be starting uh, in this room around lunchtime. So we're going to close at 11 a.m., um, and I'm just going to ask um, folks, we're going to kind of try and leave the room then, so I'm even going to ask our panelists. We can certainly continue the conversation to the, to the extent folks have time and interest out in the lobby, but we'll just need to clear out of this room. Uh, so with that, let me introduce our panelists and dive in. Um, we're going to start with Jason Cameras. J Jason directs the human capital work in the District of Columbia Public Schools. And he has really uh, spearheaded and managed the development and early implementation of IMPACT, uh, the new teacher evaluation system in DC. Jason is a former National Teacher of the Year um, and started his uh, teaching career through Teach for America, actually at Susan Middle School here in DCPS. Uh, and Sarah Kuhn is Chief of Staff at the Achievement First Public Charter School Network. Um, and she has actually helped to manage the new teacher evaluation and career pathway work uh, at Achievement First. Um, previously, Sarah was director of the 
uh, Education Policy Center uh, at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, and Sarah also uh, joined, uh, started her teaching career as a Teach for America core member. Uh, just an interesting uh, comment on the impact of Teach for America on sort of uh, producing the next generation of, of leaders in public education. Um, and then um, when they've talked a little bit about their, uh, the work in their systems, uh, we'll hear some sort of reflections and synthesis from Rachel Curtis. Rachel Curtis uh, is sort of a, a lifelong uh, public school educator and um, was assistant uh, superintendent in Boston Public Schools under Tom Paisant and helped to found the Boston Teacher Residency. She's now a consultant to urban school districts on human capital issues and has been working with the Aspen Institute for the last several years, um, helping us to uh, sort of infuse our uh, urban district leader networks with the human capital work and actually uh, co-edited uh, Teaching Talent, a human capital book from Harvard Education Press. If anybody's interested, uh, you can link to it on our website. Um, and with that, uh, let me turn to the panelists um, and, and um, let me just give three sort of framing questions that I'm hoping they will broadly respond to. Um, and so the first, uh, we, we asked them three questions to discuss what their systems chose as the entry point into the work and why. Why did they choose that as the lever? Um, what are the biggest successes thus far and the toughest challenges they're facing? Uh, and then just to reflect on the most in important learnings and what advice they would offer to system leaders who are uh, just getting into this work um, now. And so, Jason, I'll turn it to you. Sure, good morning, everyone. Uh, so let me try to answer all of those as best as I can, and I'll try to be brief so that we can hear from you. So the, the entry point. well. Let me just try to paint the context for you a, a few years ago in the District of Columbia public school system. So we had uh, nominally a teacher evaluation system. Um, I, it was a system that I was evaluated under as a teacher. I say nominally because I know for a fact based on my own experience and based on those of my colleagues that a lot of teachers never got evaluated at all. They were supposed to get one, maybe two observations over the course of the year, but in many cases that just didn't happen. Uh, in addition, when it did happen, it was all on pieces of paper and file cabinets all across the school system and school offices and whatnot. So we had no idea with any great um, reliability what these evaluations were saying. So when, when uh, Chancellor Rhee was appointed and we started this work, we tried to gather up some information, gather up these pieces of paper and try to figure out what these things were actually saying when they, when they were happening. And what we found is that just about 95% or more uh, of the evaluations were saying that the teachers were doing a great job. And this is in a school system at the time when 8% of our kids could read on grade level. So clearly there was a massive disconnect between what this nominal teacher evaluation system was saying about the quality of our teachers and the achievement of our children. And so we identified this as a very high priority. We needed to implement a system that really reflected the variation in teacher performance uh, so that we could then do a whole bunch of things that we think are really important to running a good school system. For example, we need to know who our best teachers are so that we can do everything humanly possible to keep them in the school system. We need to know who's struggling so that we can figure out how do we help them. And quite frankly, we need to know who is not effective in the classroom and who should be transitioned out into to other work. Um, also, with all this data, we can identify which of our pipeline programs are producing the best folks. Right? You don't know if, if this college or that college is, is the best uh, uh, pipeline if you don't know how your folks are actually doing. You don't know if your professional development is doing anything for your teachers unless you can measure the impact that it has then on teacher performance and ultimately student achievement. So there, there are literally tens and tens of questions that you need to be able to answer from a human capital perspective. Uh, with, and to do that, you need to have this data. So we set out to create a system that would enable us to make smarter decisions. And at the foundation of all this was a, a framework for what good teaching looks like. And that was really the, the launching off point. We didn't have in the system a clear set of standards for what we thought good teaching was. And that's essential to not only an evaluation system, but to professional development, um, to, to organize the whole school system. And so that uh, began the process of developing what we call the teaching and learning framework, uh, which is our stake in the ground around what we think good teaching looks like based upon research and surveys of other school systems and interviews and focus groups with our own teachers and lots of other folks in the field. 
that really was the launching off point, the foundation uh, for the work, which then formed not only impact, but as I said, lots of other work throughout the school system. Uh, your second question was, uh, what did we... Successes thus far and the toughest thus challenges. Far. Yeah. So I think the success is that we, <clears throat> we actually have a uh, rigorous evaluation system which is grounded in student achievement, so it's grounded in, in student outcomes, um, that evaluates uh, this year we are hitting 99.5 or 6 percent of all teachers have been assessed. And I know that for a fact. I have hard data on all these people. Um, and it's producing real variation. We're seeing there are folks who are really, really strong and folks who are solid, folks who kind of need help, and folks who really aren't that effective. And I think just having that variation is really the starting off point, because now we can differentiate what we need to do and respond to all those human capital questions that I talked about. Um, and, and, and through that, I think teachers have a clear understanding of what they actually are expected to do for the first time. And I'd say as a success, um, uh, though we have more work to do in this area through IMPACT, we've provided over 20,000 hours of professional development through the post-observation conferences, the other work that master educators and instructional coaches are doing. There's actually just released a study um, about the Cincinnati evaluation system which said just the process of going through evaluation can have lasting impacts on the, the, uh, the performance of teachers and what they do, how they actually respond. And so I feel like this is a, is a, is a real key success. I think challenges, uh, the biggest one is, is implementation. You know, we have uh, about 4,200 uh, teachers. Uh, actually, impact covers not just teachers, so it covers everybody from custodians to counselors to teachers. So we're actually um, assessing about 7,000 people. Um, over the course of the year in a pretty robust way. Uh, that's a lot of work to do, a lot of moving parts to keep track of. So it's really 20 different evaluation systems with um, upwards of, of you know, 30 different evaluation criteria that we're looking at. Um, and so uh, there's, there's a small but very um, active team of folks that is really the engine behind all of this. And they make sure this all gets done, tracks everything. And I just think for for school systems, particularly large school systems, don't underestimate the, 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 the work that's involved in implementing a robust evaluation system. I have countless reports sitting on my shelf uh, back in my office which say, these are the core principles you should have in the evaluation system, right? They should be grounded in student outcomes, and you should have multiple observations, and uh, you know, there's five or six things, and they're in every report, uh, but then you actually got to do that. And figuring out actually how you do that and how you put them together, and that's the hard part. I actually, I'm glad to say, I think as a movement, we're, we're getting to the place where it's not too controversial or not as controversial to say we should have student achievement in a teacher evaluation. Uh, I think the, the, the tough work is, well, how, how exactly do you do that? Um, and, and how should you do observations? And how many? And how long? And how, what happens? And all that sort of thing. So I think that's one of the real key challenges, and, and folks shouldn't underestimate that work. And your last question, and, sorry. And any particular lessons learned or, or just the advice you would give uh, to system leaders who are just engaging this work now? So I'm just going to, my one piece of advice, I think, if, if you left here today, is to system leaders is to be bold and courageous. I, I think there is a, understandably, a desire to come up with the perfect system that will take into account every possible challenge issue that will make sure that everybody is happy and, and gets exactly what they need. And quite frankly, it just doesn't exist. And what we found is there's an inherent tension between sort of uh, clarity and, and, and um, sort of simplicity on the one hand and sort of robustness, complexity, fairness on the other hand. And we're sort of always trying to balance these two things. And so I, I would just encourage system leaders to, to be bold and push forward and, and not get too, uh, too trapped in saying, you know what, we got to spend the next seven years to get everything mapped out and cross every T and dot every I. Um, because quite frankly, I, I believe the perspective we have to look at these things is, this is fundamentally work about making sure that every 
teacher in every classroom is, is a solid teacher that you'd be happy putting your own children into that teacher's classroom. And so if that means that on the margins, there might be a little bit of measurement error here or there, and so you might slightly misclassify a teacher here or there. Um, I think you've got to balance that against, well, what does it mean for a child to have a, a, a low-performing teacher or to not have a high-performing teacher for a couple of years in a row? We know that's devastating to kids. And so I, I just continue to push school leaders to sort of step back and say, yes, we want to be fair, and yes, we want to be um, you know, complex and robust in the way we're doing all this work, but we also can't uh, uh, sort of delay and, and tinker so much so that we, in, in essence, sort of keep pushing the ball down the road because every year kids are losing out and fundamentally we're going to always put kids above adults and I think, uh, I think that's the perspective you have to have. Great. Thanks, Jason. Sarah. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. So the first question, why did we start this? Um, it really came from our teachers. We had begun hearing two different things from our teachers. First, we had invested a lot in a leadership pipeline. Teachers could become coaches, grade level chairs, they could be a leadership fellow, deans, principal and residence principals. It was very clear what that trajectory looked like. And our teachers, many of our strongest teachers were saying, I wanna have my impact be in the classroom what does my career path look like? Second, um, they said, we're doing a great job of developing our new inexperienced teachers. How are we gonna focus on our really great teachers and take them to master teacher level? How are we gonna continue that investment? These were great questions to ask and certainly deserved our attention. So for us, the focus was not about an opportunity to move out underperforming teachers. We are all at will employees. I'm an at will, all of our teachers are. So it's really about rewarding excellent teachers and also defining what excellence looks like. So that's really where we started this work was with that definition. We knew that was gonna be the hardest part was to figure out what is an excellent teacher. We had already had something called the essentials of effective instruction, which are described in the case study. And that's a common picture of what quality instruction looks like, but we wanted to have something that was really comprehensive and holistic about everything it takes to be a great teacher. So we started um, by talking with teachers, and we had 10 different input groups over the course of a year. We'd come up with models, get their feedback, improve it, go back again, get more feedback, improve it, improve it and um, creating that shared definition I think went a really long way in our teachers investment. We quickly came to agreement on the fact that we wanted to focus on four things. Two student outcomes, quality of instruction, and core values and contributions, I'm sorry, the two inputs, I said that backwards, my inputs are quality of instruction, and core values and contributions to the team, and then two student outcomes, student achievement <clears throat> and student character. As Jason said, the hard part is figuring out how exactly you define each of those pieces and how you evaluate them. So we, as I said, we worked really closely with teachers to come up with that evaluation process. Some of our successes, I think, relate to the evaluation that we did create. Um, it is comprehensive, I think, in most systems that I've seen um, include uh, lesson observations and they include a focus on student outcomes, but including those other pieces has made a big difference. Student character is really hard to measure, but it's half of our mission, and we know we're not gonna get kids to and through college unless we focus on that as well. So we included um, that piece. <coughs> and secondly, one of the big fears that teachers mentioned um, about this was they were afraid it was going to be too individualized. It was so much about the individual teacher. And they kept saying, teaching is a team sport. Teaching is a team sport. So we did two things to affect that, um, to adjust for it. One is we have a peer survey and a principal survey that focuses on what are the contributions that this team member is making to the overall team and the overall success of the school. 
And secondly, we have a school-wide bonus where every person in the entire school has an opportunity to earn up to 10% bonus based on the overall school outcomes. Uh, the second big success, I think, was um, we, we invested a lot in our teachers being a part of this, and we had a great um, outcomes because of it. Our teachers are really invested. We not only had those initial <coughs> input groups with um, volunteers and people we invited, but we also went to every single one of our schools, and our two co-CEOs and myself, which I know we're a much smaller network, but it's still a big investment. We're across two states. It takes me several hours to get to some of our schools. And we went, we presented, we asked them for their feedback, and we got both verbal feedback, but we also had written feedback. And so I can say 98.6% of our teachers believe this is the right direction to go. And I think it's because we took the time to really engage them in that process. The trick is gonna be keeping that um, investment over time. Two challenges, um, the biggest have been the data infrastructure. Creating a comprehensive evaluation is the right thing to do for our teachers. The amount of data that we are collecting, analyzing, reporting is enormous, and finding systems that can do that has been very, very challenging. Um, if people have ideas, come talk to me. Um, and then the really evaluating student achievement, um, it had been just untested subjects that we had been really worried about anywhere where there wasn't an end of course state exam. But we're actually now concerned about the value added measures as well. And it's really about student achievement in general. Um, how it's being evaluated and how it's being communicated is really challenging. Um, lessons learned. This is my favorite part and I'm actually going to get specific with the ones because two years ago I wish I had had these lessons learned um, shared with me. Um, and so I want to tell you exactly if you're starting this work, here's what uh, I wish I had known two years ago. Um, there's two things I think that are foundationally critical before you even start. One, um, I believe you need to have a very clear common definition of what instructional excellence looks like. We had had the essentials for several years. Teachers were trained on them. They had been developed and supported. They had evaluations that were not high stakes. They were comfortable with it. This is OK to roll this out because they're used to um, this definition and feel supported in it. Um, secondly, having school leaders that teachers really trust. Having people who are doing the observations that they know are great instructors themselves. And our, our principals, they've seen them teach, they know they're excellent. I think if you're, um, you know, I think there's other ways to do this as well. I think the master educators that DC is working with and having, you know, really, really wonderful, credible educators evaluating is another great approach to that. So once you have those two foundations, I think once you embark on this work, there's a few things to keep in mind. Um, one, build it with the teachers. We did this in large part because we wanted great teacher investment, but really at the end of the day, the biggest benefit has been it's a much better evaluation. Our teachers are really, really smart. They, count, they saw all the unintended consequences. <laughs> they are the ones that pushed us in different directions, and they were really right. It's a lot better than it would have been if it had been you know, me and the co-CEO sitting in the back making something up. Um, and then having that ongoing feedback loop so it can continue to improve. Um, I really liked what Jason said, like don't underestimate this work. Um, it is enormous. Uh, I think that we initially started sort of our little career pathway team working and that's not good enough. It's cross-functional. Every single team facilities is the only team I've been able to come up with in the entire network that is not somehow involved in this at this point. Getting them all engaged and invested and understanding their role is really important. Um, pilot, pilot, pilot. We did a very small pilot last year. We're doing a large scale whole network pilot this year. For us, that's been really important. The logistics involved in all of this, making sure everybody's normed around our rubric, has been really hard. And I think taking the time to pilot this is making sure that next year it rolls out really smoothly and uh, is a fair and valid assessment of our teachers. Last two, um, value added is imperfect. 
Um, it's not, you can't use just a value added measure and know if you have a good teacher or a bad teacher. I'm very worried about when I see in the newspaper somebody's publishing value added measures. Um, I, I think it's an incredibly valuable tool um, and can be really, really helpful for a, teach and a teacher and their coach. But it needs to be one of multiple measures. It needs to be, we need to figure out how to really clearly communicate it and use that data in a productive way, but it's not the, the holistic evaluation of who's a good teacher and who's not. Um, finally, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, reach out. Um, I've learned so much. Districts and CMOs across the country are all struggling with the exact same questions. Our districts are started in very different places. I had a meeting with some fo uh, folks on Jason's team um, about a month ago, and the challenges are the same. Um, so learning from each other. Thanks to the Aspen Institute, we now have some lovely case studies to work from. Um, I just told Jason we borrowed, um, uh, we looked at their observation rubric and actually liked theirs better than ours, and we've changed ours, and it now looks more similar to theirs. There's a lot of great tools out there. Just please make sure that you're learning from, and then as you make your th our stuff better, share it back with us so we can continue to improve ours as well. Terrific. Thanks, Sarah. And now we're going to turn to Rachel Curtis for some sort of synthesis and observations about what she found uh, writing the profiles in both systems, and then start to get your questions ready because we will turn out to the audience. It's a pleasure to see you all. Thank you for coming. I think the, the couple of points that I would uh, make, and some, and some of them are really just echoing things that Jason and Sarah have said. And, and so one is about this issue of uh, context and entry point. And one of the things that was really interesting uh, in, in researching the two pieces is that uh, this can't and won't look the same in two places. And actually, there'd be great cause for concern if it started to because there are such uh, complex contextual issues about where people start. And, and Sarah's, uh, one of Sarah's last comments about eventually they have a lot of shared uh, elements. And so, so we're getting smarter about what are the characteristics of an effective evaluation system. But the way of going about doing that has to be profoundly contextual. And as, as Jason and Sarah talked about their entry points, you sort of saw they were doing this for really different reasons. And what they're going to have at the end of this will probably be quite similar in what it makes possible for the system and for kids and for teachers. But the way they're going about it is, is quite different. So I, I think that's important for us. And I think about that particularly in the context of this policy environment, where there's a lot of desire to, let's go solve the evaluation problem. And, and so we, when you take a complicated thing and you want to solve it, you tend to reduce it to, to something that, that, at its best, holds both the simplicity of it and the complexity of it, but we run the risk of simplifying this into something that doesn't accomplish what we want for kids and, and for adults. So I think that's a really important point. Uh, the other things that uh, ties to that is the question of pace. And what's so impressive about both AF and DC's work is the commitment they've made to keeping getting this right. And, and, it, and as Jason said, you can't let the goal of perfect hold you off until the Common Core standards are here. There are like so many things you would want to have in place until value add is all worked out. It's never going to happen, right? So, so we start somewhere. But in starting somewhere, we have to commit to having this be dynamic. It can't get uh, uh, put in place and then that's it because too much is changing around it. And we're learning so much at this phase in the work that has to be uh, generative and help us keep refining things. So I think the dance here is, uh, again, in this policy environment, how do we create space for this to be dynamic and evolving? Because it is. Uh, and, to, and to reduce it to something else is going to be uh, a real problem. The other thing that uh, was very striking to me as someone who, who worked in a large urban system that was um, generally characterized as reasonably high functioning. <laughs> and, you know, if you worked in it, you, you, you saw all the challenges associated with it. But the requirements of this, like it's, you think you're starting with evaluation. But the tentacles are stunning, right? So, so you start with evaluation. And evaluation tells you how teachers are doing. But then, as both Jason and Sarah spoke to, the question is, so what? Like, how are we going to help teachers improve? How are we going to figure out how to leverage the expertise of our most talented teachers 
to attend to the greatest needs of our system. And so very quickly, you've got, there's an HR element, there's a teaching and learning element, there's a PD element. And, and, and not only is everybody going to have to figure out what part of the elephant they hold and how the, the, the professional development of a system is going to be realigned to support all of this work, but then they also have to figure out how they're all going to work together. And I would just suggest to you, uh, coming from an urban school system, that's a pretty huge undertaking, right? Because it's not part of the culture of most districts. And so this is issue of uh, working collaboratively, and it brings up some very interesting opportunities around how you incentivize that kind of work. So, so what does it mean to be part of a central office, right? And you're back there thinking, well, I thought we were just going to evaluate teachers, right? And you very quickly get into this much bigger conversation about how the system functions um, that, that have to get taken on to, to do this to maximum effect. So um, I think those are some of the sort of key points I'd, I'd share at this point, and then we'll see where we go from here. Sounds good. So I'm going to start us out with a, a couple of questions, and, and um, Sarah and Jason, if you have uh, reflections on what Rachel said or what you heard from the other, feel free to add those in. I'm going to ask one question about sort of the coaching and support, and then, and then another about the measurement issue. But um, Sarah, Achievement First has a pretty innovative way. There's a pretty intensive coaching model in place, and I think the, when, when I'm describing that to folks, the, the question comes up as, well, how are they able to provide all of that coaching? So if you would talk a little bit about how you've been able to structure and what that coaching looks like, and, and also whether that's changed at all as you've made evaluations somewhat more formal mm -hmm. um, and involved different people. And, um, and, and then, um, Jason, I'm going to ask you also then to reflect on, you know, at the beginning, the sort of, the, the master educators and coaches in DCPS have been separate, and there's been sort of an evaluation role and a coaching role. The master educators play some kind of a coaching role. And, and so is that, how is that converging in year two, or how are you sort of, what's it look like to, to marry that, that sort of guidance and support side with the evaluation side? What are you, what issues are surfacing uh, around that in DCPS? But Sarah, if you'll start us off. Sure. So coaching is incredibly important in our schools. Um, almost all teachers do have a coach. We're working towards all. Um, and it's a coach within their building. Most frequently it is a principal or a dean. We have academic deans and then deans of students. And for all of those people, their primary goal and their primary time they spent, the way they spend most of their time is as an instructional leader and as a coach. We also have a director of school operations. We have a three-person operations team in every school, and that really helps to take the rocks off the road so that people can focus on instruction. We do have some teacher coaches as well. Um, and then centrally, we have some content experts that will go out and um, you know, help schools in specific subject areas. So um, the coaching, uh, our teachers are observed every week, um, maybe every other week, and they have ongoing feedback. They'll be focused in on particular pieces of the essentials. So if it's um, the sort of end of the lesson assessment is where they've been struggling, um, the check for understanding, that's what they'll be focusing on for several weeks. They'll come up with a game plan and focus in that area. There, this is a, something that has been raised as a potential concern is how is that relationship going to change as they do become more evaluative and less of just a coach. And um, I think it's important to realize that outside of education, your manager and your coach are the same person. Um, and this is an OK way for the education world to function as well. Um, and we really, I mean, their first goal is around coaching. The evaluation part is part of that. It's helping them to have a really clear understanding of what the expectations are, where they are at that moment, and then how to improve. Um, so it's not as broad. Um, I know the evaluations I got as a teacher were great. And I wasn't a great teacher. I was a first year teacher. And it, didn't, it wasn't specific enough to help me get better. So I think this is actually part of the ongoing coaching. But we do have to make sure that um, you know, teachers feel good about it and coaches are well trained as their role shifts slightly. Uh, a couple of things. So one, I just want to note that one of the largest 
programmatic investments that DCPS has made over the last four years is in coaching. So to the tune of um, you know, $15 million, uh, this makes it probably one of the top two or three things that we've done over the past four years. So every school now has at least one instructional coach, sometimes two. In addition, we have mentor teachers for our first year uh, educators. So this is a huge investment. Is it totally working? I'm not sure, and, uh, and I'm honest about that. But here's what impact and teacher evaluation lets us do for the first time, is to begin to understand where it is working and where it's not working, and to then make the appropriate changes so that we can help our teachers better. And let me be very concrete. Our coaches are evaluated under impact. What are they evaluated on? Well, a big chunk of their evaluation is the extent to which the teachers they work with get improved observational scores over time. Does that make sense? Right? And uh, this is, again, to Rachel's point, you know, evaluation is sort of just one little piece of this. And then it sort of spreads out as what do you do with the data? So now we're able to assess who's actually doing a good job of coaching. And what are these people doing? And why are they different than these people over here? And how do we replicate what's happening over here? And so this data now allows us to be really smart about how we use, quite frankly, our limited resources to get better at coaching, to get better at professional development. You asked Ross about the coach and the, and the ME and how that all works. Uh, you know, the master educator is, is largely evaluative, but they also have taken on, both formally and informally, a lot of professional development. So they not only do these post-observation conferences with their teachers, they're writing on average a five-page written report for every observation that they do. So literally, teachers get these very comprehensive analyses of what's going on in their classrooms with specific evidence and specific guidance for improvement. These conferences, which uh, you know, are at a minimum half an hour, sometimes range two and three hours. The ME just sits with them and goes through all sorts of things. And then the MEs do office hours, so they make themselves available to you know, come and talk with a teacher about a specific issue. They also did this year what we called inquiry groups. So these were content-specific sort of PLCs with a small group of teachers over the course of a couple of months. Uh, and we're still trying to figure out what is the best way to, to leverage their, their expertise in the school system. I will say, you know, we do have this um, bizarre uh, sort of statutory issue, which is that you know, one teacher can't evaluate another teacher. Um, and so as a result of that, we've had to create this sort of artificial wall between peer coaching and evaluation. I, I would agree with Sarah that at the end of the day, right, the, your manager and your coach are typically the same person um, in, in most professions. And, and I think it makes sense to instill more of that idea uh, in, in education as well. Great. So. Um, one more question. This one's about measurement. Sarah, you talked a little bit about um, value added and that it sort of can't be the only thing. And I think we hear all the time in these conversations, we've got to use multiple measures. But one of the things, I think one of the, one of the early findings coming out of DCPS is that there's a moderate correlation between value added and the observational ratings, but they aren't, you know, they're giving you different signals in lots of cases as well. And I'm curious, uh, and, and I mean, I think that's going to be the case in lots of systems. That's in part, um, a reflection on value added itself, uh, you know, moves around a fair amount, especially um, on an individual teacher basis. What are you? What's the goal in terms of? Is there an expectation that those things will start to converge, or what are the conversations in your systems like? How do you talk to principals um, and to teachers about? Well, you, you know, you've gotten uh, high observations and, uh, and low value added. So what are we to make of that? Or vice versa, you've got high value added and low observation ratings. I'm just curious how that how that sort of these issues are kind of uh, rolling out as the data becomes available in your systems. And you do see, uh, you know, as often as they, they tell you the same thing, um, they'll tell you, they'll give you different messages as well. What do you do with that? You want to start that off, Jason? Uh, sure. So, you know, the way we currently deal with it operationally, just technically, is, is we average these things together. So if you have high observation scores and low value added scores, or vice versa, and they get averaged together, it's going to put you somewhere in the middle, which conceptually is probably about right, right? Where we have some conflicting data, 
it, so you kind of are in the middle. It doesn't mean that um, you know, you're getting bonuses. It doesn't mean you're getting fired. It means let's hold and look at you another year. I think over time, as we have more data and we're able to analyze exactly what's going on there, is there something systematic that's going on? Why we have some of these divergences one way or the other? And then I think we'll be able to, to iterate appropriately. You know, to Rachel's point, we're going to continue to evolve. Um, so this is something that we continue to look at, but we've sort of made the decision at this point when the data points in different directions, it puts you in the middle. And for us, it's less of an average. For each of those four different components, the two outputs and the two inputs that I mentioned, um, we're going to have a, a clear standard, kind of a cut score for each of those. Because I think it's important. I don't want anyone to become a master teacher who's not a good teammate. Like you have to meet the threshold for each of those things. Um, so what we're doing is we actually, once again, borrowed a great idea um, from another district. It was from New Haven um, School District. And they are looking at kind of an x, y axis. And if the outcomes and the inputs align, it's pretty clear how the teacher is doing. If they're not aligned on that axis, then you need to go back and revisit that teacher. Um, we're in our large scale pilot year this year, so we haven't fully designed that yet. That's kind of one of my many summer projects. Um, but really designing what that appeal process looks like and what, you know, I think we'll probably go back and do more observations um, to ensure that we have a really clear picture of that teacher. Great. Um, any reflections? Uh, anything any of you are dying to say before we turn it over to? Audience. No, I think, I mean, I think the thing that I'm just left sitting here with is getting this part right is so layered and it's so complicated and, and this, this desire we have to have this be really neat and easy and you're a 2.73 or you're a, um, has a potential to do a stunning disservice to the practice of teaching. And so, so the, the nuances of this I think are, are ones that we're going to, we need to be incredibly intentional about continuing to learn from each of these districts about what they're learning. Um, and this issue of what will be the mix of measures both for tested subjects and untested subjects, but I'm also curious to see, like three years from now, I'm very curious to see what tested subjects is going to look like. Mm -hmm. And like what's going to be the mix of measures there? Because my, my instinct is if we do this well, that's going to evolve a fair bit uh, in addition to the dilemmas around non-tested subjects. Great. Um, so I know we've got lots of folks who are uh, focused on this work in different ways in this room, so I want to turn it uh, over to you to ask questions. Uh, and if you would, uh, please wait for the microphone to come around and please identify yourself and uh, the organization um, that, that you work with. Uh, so we've got a question right here, actually. Hi, thanks. Great panel. Uh, loved it. My name is Amy Hightower. I work for Editorial Projects and Education in the Research Center. Um, Sarah, you had a great point about saying um, how Achievement First has looked at um, New Haven school districts and DC public schools. Uh, Jason, you also referenced um, various uh, surveys and interviews with other school systems. And Ross, you started this whole thing out um, by saying that, uh, referencing the district leadership network and DC public schools having a lot to teach other large urban school systems. And so my question is, is I think mostly to you, Jason, but I'd love to hear from anybody up there about just sort of flipping that on its head and wondering, um, as you've been developing the system uh, about, for evaluation of DC public schools, what, to, to whom have you turned? Um, uh, in the development of that work. And um, I, I don't know if you're familiar enough uh, to speak directly uh, about uh, San Diego City Schools and mm -hmm. some of the work that they did about a dozen or so years ago with uh, Alan Burson and Tony Alvarado. But you know, there, I, there, there seem to be some parallels and some disconnects as well from, sure. from your effort. So sure. I'm wondering if you could talk just a little bit about other places where you've looked. Yeah, I'm not familiar specifically with San Diego. Um, but we did do a survey of large urban school systems, so looked at what's happening in New York and Chicago and LA, Atlanta, Houston. Uh, we looked at other charter schools, so we looked at AAF and KIPP and Uncommon Schools um, and a couple others as well. Um, also, you know, looked at the, um, the think tank community, right? So talked to Ed Trust and NCTQ and um, uh, New Schools Venture Fund and the New Teacher Project. Um, looked at the work that Teach for America has done in developing their rubric for, 
for teaching, teaching us leadership. Um, so yeah, we don't claim to you know, be the source of all knowledge on this work. So really we spent a year just talking to as many people as we could to try to understand what, the, what, what it looked like out there and, um, and then put our best foot forward. And I think we're excited to see what other folks are doing. Um, I'm excited about the work that the Gates Foundation is doing through the MET project. I think there's a lot of interesting learning, particularly in terms of um, student surveys of, of, of teacher effectiveness. And so, you know, my, my hope is that based on the, the catalyzing force of Race to the Top and, and other uh, forces, that we'll have a lot of innovation in this field and we'll, we'll continue to all iterate and get to an even better place. So you want to talk about uh, what achievement sure. first drew from? Every, I mean, everybody. Um, and I think what's been really exciting about this work is that um, people have been just so open. We hosted a summit in the fall, and we had 30 different districts and CMOs in attendance. And the biggest takeaway, what everybody was saying at the end, was how exciting and refreshing it was for districts and CMOs to be in one room. Um, and to be not having conversations about how do charters and districts work together, but like to get into the meat of the work and really problem solve together um, because the challenges are similar. Um, I certainly, I think uh, the entire list Jason mentioned was great. I, I would add, I think Denver is doing some really interesting good work in Hillsboro um, as well are great models to look at. And then uh, there's a, Consortium, the College Ready Promise, um, a consortium of uh, charters in LA. And then Pittsburgh is, Pittsburgh has some really exciting things happening. Great. We've got a question right over here. Richard Maines of the Council for Exceptional Children. I want to compliment uh, all of your work. It's uh, really uh, good to hear this conversation and to uh, hear about the issues you're uh, dealing with. We are dealing with uh, some of these accountability issues in, for special educators. And some of our teachers are telling us, I work with an English teacher and a social studies teacher and a math teacher, uh, and they don't have a way to parse the value added variance. Mm -hmm. How have you guys addressed some of those issues? This is a big issue at Achievement First because our students move around a lot. Um, we have interim assessments every six weeks, and then the students are regrouped, um, particularly in the elementary schools, based on the interim assessments. It's all about what's going to be best for our students. We don't want to mess with that just to have an evaluation for teachers. So um, our value-added model um, includes a dosage. So what that means is we actually have to track how, when students are with what teacher and at what period of time, and all of that goes into this very fancy statistical model <laughs> that people much smarter than me created. And um, they're able to give us a more precise measurement, and I think that's probably what would need to happen um, with your educators too, is really looking at when they're working with what teachers and what students at what time. It adds complication to the model, um, but I think that it's worth it. It's, but the, I think, it goes back to the earlier point, like the complexity and fairness that you're balancing with the transparency and not wanting to feel like all this stuff is going into a black box and that nobody understands the measure. So I think you're constantly struggling with that, like what is going to be the best measure versus what is going to be really fair and, or open and transparent. That's the hard part. We do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Right here? Just go ahead with Bill and then uh, right behind as well. Hi, Bill Turk from the Washington Post. This is for Jason. Um, you have in excess of uh, 700 teachers now who are um, deemed minimally effective. We have a one-on-one -on -one, like tomorrow. You can wait till that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just warming, just limbering up. Every opportunity. You get. All right, come on, Bill. Limbering up. You can change your answer tomorrow. Um, the 700 or so minimally effective teachers, how are you aligning or reorienting your professional development to address uh, or, or to support these teachers? 
So uh, number one, you know what we realized in talking with a lot of these folks is they actually were not completely aware of all of the opportunities that we had when it comes to professional development. So we actually, uh, a few months ago, put together a comprehensive guide for all of the professional development opportunities that are going on in the school system. So I don't know if you've seen that yet, Bill, but I can certainly forward that to you. And we sent that um, to every, made it available to all the teachers in the school system, and, and then sent a copy home to the, the folks who were minimally effective to make sure that they were aware of everything that's going on. So, yeah? Uh, so this, this is basically, the initiative is completely on them. This is like, they have to seek this out, and they have to go find what they need in the system to, to improve their practice. So I'm going to respond. Let me finish completely. So let me say this. Um, this, was, this was one piece of this effort. Um, I, I will say this. There is a difference of philosophy here than I think existed in years past, which is, um, I'm going to slightly paraphrase what you said, but I think in, in the way that we think is right. You know, we think in professional settings, um, the, the responsibility to improve and become even more effective at your work is one that each individual should take ownership for. Um, that doesn't mean that we um, absolve ourselves of any responsibility there. We've actually, as I said, made a pretty huge investment in this area and, and are continuing to do so in a lot of different ways. As you well know, Bill, one of the things that our teachers have asked for the most in this area is what does excellence look like, which is why we're investing another million dollars in the development of a professional development platform, which is literally going to have over 100 videos of our best teachers that will then be available to all teachers, and particularly the folks who are minimally effective, so that they can see what excellence looks like. Then we align the master educator work, the coach work, the mentor work, all towards that as well. But uh, yes, at the end of the day, we do believe it is your responsibility as a professional to seek out those opportunities and to, uh, uh, to, to work on your practice. It's our responsibility to make sure that there are opportunities there available for you and to coordinate those things um, so that you can be successful. We have another question uh, right back there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I listen to Bill. Uh, uh, professional development is very important for our teachers. Because this also uh, prepares our teachers and also partners. Can you just identify uh, yourself and where Oh, I'm sorry. My name, good, good morning. My name is Dorothy Douglas. I'm with the State Board of Education. So, my concern uh, that the bill addressed, and I think all the other teachers are, are really concerned about, is the professional development. That's so important and partner. So, I just want to know what partnerships are also involved besides uh, uh, the principal and um, other organizations. And what I did not hear is parents' involvement. That's a very, very important issue. To, uh, uh, to help our children to, uh, to reach their, their goals. So we need to have the, uh, the unity of all these partnerships and making sure involved in the professional development. So without this, our teachers won't be prepared. So we want to have qualified teachers, so we need to have all those uh, uh, services available for the teachers and for our students to reach the high achievement in education. Yeah, I'll just say it's good to see you again. As, as we discuss at the state board yes. hearing, uh, you know, one of the pieces that we do assess our, our teachers on is the extent to which they engage with their students' families. They make the home visits, the phone calls, the letter writing, make sure that the, their classrooms are um, welcoming environments for their students' families, because we do believe that's an essential piece of, of instruction. Um, and so we're trying to incentivize that work, and we know that our best teachers are doing that already, so we want to make sure that they're getting credit for that as well. Bill Hawley, uh, University of Maryland and Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, not to complicate your lives further, but um, as you know, uh, there is considerable evidence that really good teachers are able to build on the experiences that their kids bring with them to school. Those experiences in turn are related to race, ethnicity, culture, linguistic diversity, etc. As I've looked at the instruments that across, and I have not had a chance to look at all of them, thank God, um, uh, I, I see the basis for going there, but I don't see the level of specificity that would allow a, 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 the kind of professional development around those issues. And I'd be interested to know how, how you're wrestling with this problem, because good teaching is good teaching is good teaching maybe, but it also requires a lot of adaptation and responsiveness to differences among kids, and it's really, it is rocket science, and how do you do it? 
So I just want to make sure I understand fully the question. Is it, um, is your premise that good teaching uh, requires differentiation based upon the cultural context of the students you're teaching? Or I just want to make sure that I'm answering appropriately. Uh, yes, but uh, there is also, of course, the not, it's not to say that one can, can go out and say, uh, we have this, these kids from different backgrounds and therefore I'm going to treat these kids differently. It's much more complicated than that, but that's exactly the point. To the extent to which one varies instruction as a teacher based on the values, the differences kids have, the worldviews they bring to schools, mm -hmm. differences, responses, the different responses to different reward structures, for example, um, how they respond to different expectation, representations of expectations, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, how do those really nuanced aspects of, of good teaching find their way into instruments which must be, in, you know, that are inherently generic? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let, let me just say a couple of things. Um, one is I think, and I think you articulated this difference, but I think when folks talk about this, there's uh, a, a bit of a muddling that goes on. I think there's a slippery slope. Some people hear what you're saying as you teach poor kids one way and you teach rich kids another way. And I know that's not what you're saying. I want to be very clear. That's not what we're saying either. Um, and we don't treat whites, to, you know, teach white children and African American children, Latino children differently either. What we do expect, and it's very explicit in our framework and what we look for, is that you are differentiating based on skill level and appropriately meeting children, um, not only where they are, but then challenging them to achieve at higher levels. And so that is a very intentional piece of what we look for. Um, in terms of sort of understanding the context in which you're teaching, um, I think you know, another piece that we look for is across your students, um, regardless of where they come from, their background, their skill level, are you exhibiting high expectations for them? And not in some Pollyannish way, but in the rigor of the lessons that you are providing, the rigor of the work that you're engaging, that you're expecting of your children, regardless of where they're starting. So that's how we've tried to attack that issue. And I'd like to add one thing. Um, I agree with everything that was said. We spoke with um, Tony Brake, is a very smart guy, and gave us some good advice. And when he was looking at what we had created and said, you know, you can't discount or you can't exclude professional judgment into all of this. And so I think that your observers need to be extremely well trained and able to look at that classroom and take into account that it's not every specific little thing on the rubric, but it is looking at the big picture and really understanding what great teaching looks like in any context um, or every context. And um, you know, including that important professional judgment. So let me ask a follow on Jason, because it seems like one of the things that I've been wrestling with is that the value added data actually go, tries pretty hard to take account of context. I mean, it doesn't just compare everybody on sort of absolute gains. It sort of asks, well, compared to kind of similar classrooms mm -hmm. where the gains similar, the, the observation ratings in DCBS, but I think pretty much everywhere don't actually try to control for context at all. And so I'm wondering, one, if you found differences in how hard it is to distinguish yourself uh, based on the context of the school in DCPS and whether you've had conversations about like how you know should an observation of practice should it account at all for context or do we want to keep that at a pretty absolute level and we'll let value added try and sort of account for context. So they're measuring two totally different things and I think when we conflate that that's where we get into trouble. What, what the observations are measuring is your pedagogical expertise. And we expect a high level of pedagogical expertise, whether you're west of the park, east of the park, um, regardless. And, and that's sort of our commitment to children. What the value added is measuring is what is this teacher's contribution to student learning. And to do that, we try to take out of the picture everything else that may in some fashion be affecting that student learning so that we are isolating the teacher's impact. Um, and so I, I just at the end of the day, I feel that they're just different things, and that's why we've treated these things in different ways. Okay. Uh, question up here. 
Uh, hi, Richard Whitmire, education writer. Um, Jason, as you know, one of the criticisms of impact is that teachers in more affluent neighborhoods, let's say Ward 3, tend to be higher rated teachers than, let's say, in Ward 8. And the suggestion being that it's easier for a teacher to become higher rated in Ward 3. Could you discuss that? Look, I think uh, there is a lot of evidence nationwide that there's an unequal distribution of teacher quality and that typically schools that are lower income tend to have the less effective teachers. And I think that that's quite frankly what you may see being played out here. Um, and uh, you know, over time we'll have more data to know what's going on, but um, again, we consistently maintain that the, the key principles of the teaching and learning framework are what good teaching is and what it looks like, and we expect to see that whether you're in Ward 8 or you're in Ward 3. Yeah. Good morning. My name is Marnie Barron, and I'm an instructional coach in DCPS. And um, I am also a teacher who had been evaluated under the old program, which was PPEP for short, um, as well as currently obviously being um, evaluated under IMPACT. And really today, my voice is representative of the teachers in the field that are most um, affected by these reforms. Um, my question really is for Jason. It's twofold. Hi, Marty. And hi. Um, <laughs> One is that in PPEP, it, it appears as though the, the problems were mainly systemic because the implementation was not aligned to necessarily having every teacher be effectively evaluated under it. But the components of PPEP that I found to be valuable and I think many other teachers found valuable were the pieces that allowed the teacher voice. So in other words, like the mutually um, established goals and having that teacher voice in there through portfolio work. And the first part of the question is, why wouldn't we have something that allows for teacher voice and impact? And the second piece of that is um, that, I'm sorry, so it, it I'm sorry, this, that's the second piece of it. The first piece is, is it necessarily accurate to say that PPEP as an instrument was flawed when it wasn't rolled out effectively, it wasn't used effectively? So I don't know that the instrument was flawed and why can't we have a holistic piece in impact? Sure. Um, so it's good to see you again. Um, uh, on the PPEP, I'd say there were at least two problems. It was inherently flawed in its construction, and it was very poorly implemented. So I think it had both of those issues. Um, on the holistic piece, I actually disagree with you, Marty. So I think there are a couple of different ways in which that voice um, plays out. So as you know, in, in the task, the teacher assessed student achievement measure, it involves a conversation between the principal and the teacher uh, in which they're working out what are the student learning goals for the students over the course of the year. Um, and, and secondly, I think, as you well know, um, in the post-observation conferences, there's often, and we encourage there to be a deep conversation about what was going on during that instruction. And at times, modifications are made on, in terms of the assessment based upon um, you know, the information that the teacher is providing at that moment. And then finally, let me just say more fundamentally, as you know, um, the, the input process, both for the development and for the assessment and continued iteration of the process, has been quite extensive. And so there's a continual process of engagement that helps inform what the next stage will be. And you've played a big role in that process in helping think about what the next iterations will be. So I actually sort of disagree with your premise and think there's a number of opportunities for that. And I think, um, and I think it's made this system better as well. Sarah, you talked some about trying to complement the value-added data with other measures of student achievement. Is that right? How is, what's the planning or the discussion look like right now in uh, Achievement First around those issues? Yeah, um, it's, one of, it's a big open question. We really thought at this point we were going to be really secure with our value-added measures. And the data hasn't shown the correlations that we want it to in order to move forward. So. We are doing several things. We're really diagnosing what the problems are. We're opening up to the possibility of using growth measures. Um, whatever we do choose, whatever that value-added piece is, uh, we do, uh, the plan is for t uh, principals to get that information and then to make good judgments using that and other student achievement data that they have around what is the teacher's student achievement component, kind of what their, their score will be for that piece. Thanks. Uh, right here. 
Joan Barrett Snowden, Education Study Center. This was an excellent panel. It's interesting to see um, systems that grow out of uh, a motivation to improve and systems that grow out of a motivation to s sort. The big message seems to be balance, balance, balance. How do you go fast enough to get something done, but not so fast. I mean, you said pilot, pilot, pilot. And Jason, who's real smart, reviewed all those places he saw, picked and chose, and said, I'll hold my nose and jump. And um, I'm particularly interested in this issue of um, the value added, because I actually think that when we figure out what the other multiple measures of achievement will be, value added will go away. It has lots of problems and it has lots of abuses outside of individual achievement. But Jason, I really don't understand how you say you average. I know you're the math teacher and I'm not, but when something's worth 50%, mm -hmm. I don't know how it averages it in averages the same way. It averages with the other 50%. Well, but uh, Bob Lynn, who is the dean of psychometrics, et cetera, um, indicated in a, in a paper that there's no way good or bad, that any teacher can recover from their value-added scores. And I ask specifically Dan Goldhaber and Tom Kane whether they would go on record to all these states that have put in their race to the top 50%, and they said, absolutely not. Uh, Goldhaber said, I'm not a lawyer, so, but I can't defend it, so would you defend it? The 50%? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Look, here's the thing. Value added is not perfect, and you've never heard me quoted anywhere, Bill, saying that it is perfect. <laughs> um, but it's why it's just 50%. And the other factors that we look at are your pedagogical expertise through five formal observations by at least two different observers, one of whom is a content expert in your area of expertise, as well as a measure of teamwork and collaboration, as well as a measure of your school's performance, again, to incentivize teamwork and collaboration. But let me, here's what I want to say about value added. Yes, it's not perfect, but it is. It, it gives us for the first time, in the fairest way possible, I honestly believe, an assessment of a teacher's contribution to the student learning of their children in a way that, quite frankly, addresses most teachers' concerns. When you sit down with teachers and talk to them about why they're upset about using student achievement, they tick off a list of things, most of which are addressed by value added. Well, it's not fair that my kids are starting at 5% proficient, and this teacher's kids are starting at 90% proficient. And I agree, and value added addresses that very fact. What we're looking for is, how did your kids do relative to their projected endpoint given where they started the year? That's what value added is. And when you sort of break that out for teachers, there's a, a thawing of, of their anxiety around it. Let me also just say this, you know, there is this this great anxiety in the education movement around value added, and, and the fact of the matter is, it is as reliable or more reliable than measures used in just about any other profession. Um, and if you read uh, the, the Brookings uh, Institute report about value added a couple of months ago, you know they speak to the fact that value the, the value added measures are as reliable or more reliable than the SATs that we use to determine what colleges kids end up going to, and lots of other things. So. I think there is this, um, I think, again, as I, as I spoke about at the beginning, there's this, um, I think, irrational need to have a perfect measure before it can be used, when quite frankly, this is such a huge advance over what we've had in the past. I'm not asking if it should be used. I'm asking if it's right. no, no. being used 50%. Yeah, so uh, here's what I would say. I, I think fundamentally, the thing that matters the most that we care about the most in terms of assessing whether a teacher is effective or not, or how effective they are, is the impact that they are having on the learning of their children. And I think of all the different ways that we could assess that, I think value added is actually the fairest way to do that. And so I think having half of your evaluation, not 90, not 100, not 80, half is, is a reasonable thing to do. All right. Oh, please. Well, and I really agree with that. I think that our environment is is unique and it, the extra challenges that we're facing have a lot to do with the environment. The value added statistics, it's a lot about outliers. 
our entire network is an outlier. So the kind of figuring out how that works um, is different. I, I am not advocating for getting rid of value added. I think it's a really important tool. And then to your point about the pacing, I do think that kind of this question of where our, our district started from has a lot to do with how we chose to pace the way we did. Um, we were not a district in crisis. Like we were not trying to solve, you know, super urgent challenges. Um, so we had the luxury of going a bit slower. Um, and for us, that has been the right choice. But I don't think that's going to be the right choice for every district. Katrin, we got a question over here. Uh, Thank you. I've really enjoyed the panel. My name is Laurie Calvert. I'm a teacher in North Carolina and a teaching ambassador fellow at the Department of Education for this year. And I wanted to make one comment and ask one question. My comment was I really support your idea of letting um, teachers choose which professional development to attend. I find in the classroom as a teacher that when I let my students make choices, they're much more invested in the process. And I think that of all of the professional development I have done through the years, I've been teaching for 15. The ones that I've chosen for myself have made the most impact on my own growth as a teacher. So I, I really support that. Here's my question. In North Carolina, and I think this is probably true in most states, there's not a way to do value added on the high school level, or at least, so what are y'all doing about that? I mean, I'm worried if I go back to North Carolina because I teach um, ninth and 10th grade English, and um, they want to use the eighth and ninth grade tests, which to, to compute my value added, which are cover completely different concepts. And so what are you doing about that? I think teachers would be less afraid of value added if they felt that the, that the testing was a little more secure than it is right now for them. So I, I'll just real quick, short-term answer and long-term answer. The short-term answer, and it's not just high school, it's also for us, it's kindergarten and first grade and second grade and art and PE and there's a lot. Uh, we, we, as I, I think I mentioned to Marty, um, you know, we do something called teacher assess student achievement. Basically, teacher sits down with principal at the beginning of the year and says, these are the goals that we're going to agree on for my children this year, and these are the assessments that we're going to use to, to know that, if they've met those goals. It might be a teacher-created assessment. It might be an end-of-the-book assessment. It might be a state assessment from another state. Um, because that's admittedly a fuzzier measure, it's actually only 10% for, for us. Um, the, honestly, the long-term answer is we need tests in high school that are aligned to what teachers are teaching in high school um, and that facilitate the use of value-added measures in high school. With the rollout of the Common Core, I think that will help provide some clarity to what those assessments should look like. And, um, you know, but that's the direction that I think ultimately we will, we will end up in. On that. Sure. Um, so uh, we're going to use standardized assessments for each of them. Um, we're looking at using SATs and AP assessments. Um, New York City is doing some work on Regents exams, actually doing value added for the Regents exams because that standard does exist. In Connecticut, where there are other schools are, we don't have that. Um, but we are not using teacher created assessments in uh, core subjects, we're using more of a standardized assessment. Um, and the enrichment courses, art, music, PE, dance, those courses where we have a portfolio um, and goal setting and then sitting down with a review committee. And, this, and similarly, it's a smaller percentage because we're less um, confident about those measures, it's 20% um, as opposed to 40% around student achievement. Right up here. Cosby Hunt, Center for Inspired Teaching. Uh, Jason, my youngest just turned two, it gets even more fun. Mm. Um, my question is this, I had a very good discussion with about 30 teachers um, last week about No Child Left Behind. So this is for each of you. Uh, hopefully you'll be invited to testify to Congress. If you have five minutes with all of Congress, um, how, what's the best way to go about reauthorizing No Child Left Behind? Rachel, why don't we start with you? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's only five minutes. No, it's more than enough. Um, gosh, 
God, there's so many. I, I was expecting race to the top. Um, I guess the things I am most concerned about are um, where we're going to place our bets. So I, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about um, which policy decisions are the right ones for the feds to be making. It feels like the reach of policy uh, right now is it's profound. I mean, it's, it, what's gone on in the last two years in this country is mind boggling, right? And, and you see the momentum that it's generated, but you can be so simultaneously concerned about the direction of the momentum. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I'm thinking a lot about what are a couple of key places to focus, and how do you do it in a way that doesn't lock people in and create a set of perverse incentives? So we learned something about perverse incentives from, from the first round of No Child Left Behind. So, so I, that's the stuff I'm thinking the most about. I'm not a policy expert, so, so obviously I'm talking pretty general terms, but um, those are the things I'm concerned about. So I'll speak relevant to our discussion today. I would say three things would be very helpful. One is requiring all states to put into place um, either at, not necessarily at the state level, but to have make sure every LEA has some teacher evaluation and some principal evaluation system in place, um, and and one that um, that has at least four different rating levels. Uh, we have lots of evaluation systems that have two levels, and so everybody gets the top level, which isn't particularly helpful to anybody for anything. Um, and I think the principal one is is important as well. This is not our point of discussion today, but as you all know, a good school leader makes makes all the difference. Um, I, I think, too, then I think the law should also require that uh, states begin to use that information uh, in making employment and compensation decisions. So um, who gets retained, who gets tenure, uh, how, you know, who gets step increases and that sort of thing. Um, and then third, I think it would make sense, you know, one thing the federal government is very good at is funding research and catalyzing change through uh, targeted grants, things like Race to the Top. So I think setting aside money to help uh, uh, spur additional research in this area, like the work that the Gates Foundation is doing and others are doing, and to have Race to the Top type grants that um, are made available to states who are doing innovative work in this area or who can create the conditions on the ground to, to make this, this type of work, um, uh, facilitate this type of work. Uh, let me just, my, sorry, this fourth thing, which is kind of related to the first, which is ultimately we should get away from an HQ, a highly qualified teacher in every classroom. And I know everyone says this now, but it, like and nobody was saying it four years ago, so <laughs> you know what I'm saying, into a highly effective, an HE sort of framework. Um, I, I know for a fact we have, um, under NCLB, we have to send home, you know, the parent right to know letters when, hey, your child's not highly qualified. And it causes everyone to freak out. Um, we have non-HQ teachers who are actually highly effective. In fact, I believe, I think I have this right, that Chancellor Rhee's own daughters had one of those situations. Um, and it's just sort of this silly thing. We shouldn't be worrying about qualifications anymore. We should be worried about effectiveness. Um, I love all of that. Um, I think there needs to be flexibility, too, within the choices. So. One of the challenges that we faced is we're in a race to the top state and we also earned a teacher incentive fund, a TIF grant. And what we wrote in the grant isn't exactly aligned to the race to the top. And so they're actually in conflict with each other. They're both approved by the federal government, but they're, they're not the same requirements. We're sort of stuck in the middle a little bit. So I think there needs to be some flexibility within those. Um, and I also, uh, I think it's just incredibly important that we are looking at more carrots um, and not as many sticks or equal number at least. I think that we, uh, you know, there were levels of underperformance. I'd really like to see rewards for levels of high performance um, and rewarding great states and great districts for the work that they're doing. Great. So we've got, I think, two more questions uh, right up here. Hi, Alice Kane with Hope Street Group. 
I have a question. Um, you said you're expecting a race to the top question, so I have a race <laughs> to the top question for you, um, for all of you on on really on the pilot phase of the process. I think that that the states have spent a lot of time um, really scrambling to try to create the perfect instrument or tool, and their time is rapidly approaching when they need to to launch it, pilot it, um, and refine it. Um, and my question specifically, which I've heard. You know, actually, pretty compelling arguments on both sides is when do the consequences start taking effect in terms of or, or decisions related to what you're learning from the evaluation system, whether it's in terms of professional development changes or human capital changes. You know, do you take some time? You know, and if so, how much time um, to phase it in and 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 refine the tool before that takes effect, or do you really jump in and, and go? with those consequences from day one. Hi, Alex. Two, two pretty um, different perspectives. Yeah, <laughs> so like, you know, we moved fast. Um, though we did, I think what folks don't realize is our, our teaching and learning framework has three big domains, a planning, teaching, and an increased effectiveness domain. We actually only assess on the teaching domain, so only one third of this. Um, precisely because we knew it was a lot to absorb, and so we actually haven't even phased in those other two pieces even now in our second year. So I think it's a falsehood to say that we did not do some phasing in. Having said all that, now I just want everyone else in the room to hear that. Um, having <laughs> said that, the yeah, having said that, we move fast. And I think the advice I would make for folks on, on Race to the Top is um, to move as fast as is reasonable to do so. We had the good fortune of having a lot of good capacity to, to do this work. Um, I get really worried when I hear things like five years and seven years. It seems an unreasonable length of time to do this kind of work. I think in a couple of years you, you should be able to be up and running and using this system and making decisions based on it. Again, I'm just going to keep coming back to how long are you going to keep your child in the school system where nobody's paying attention to who's good and who's not? That is just insane. And so we got we got to move fast again with with we have to be fair and respectful and deliberate, but we got to move fast. It, it, I would say also there's an urgency capacity tension here, mm -hmm. and 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 I would say that DC has a lot of capacity, and it was a very heavy lift. So I just want to be clear: we don't have like a hundred people running around doing this. No, work. but you had a lot of you were very thoughtful, yeah, and put a lot of effort into this. I, I, work, I work in other districts, and, and this is also sometimes a urban, suburban tension also, like that this isn't yet on their, this is just getting on their s screen, and it's most getting on their screen if they're in a race to the top state. So, so this issue of capacity uh, is profound. So, so districts where principals are being introduced to the idea of their role in leading instructional improvement Right? And that's a conversation that other districts have been having for, for years and years. So I think the urgency in me says it's got to happen in a couple of years. The other side of it is how is the capacity going to be built? And the, and the trick is it's not clear what are the incentives to states on capacity building. Right? So it's pretty clear what the, the incentives are around accountability. It's much murkier around capacity. So the biggest worry is we're going to have an accountability system without capacity building and we're going to be it's going to be a variation of the dilemmas we've been facing all along. And Sarah, as you answer, and I'd love to come back to you for a minute, Jason, if you could also talk about how you're, what are the mechanisms for sort of learning and continuous improvement that you're putting in place? How are you expecting to learn and, and adapt uh, if there are such mechanisms? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that it's important. I obviously think it's important to pilot it. Um, we. I think that you need two years of value-added data before it has high-stakes consequences. The more years of data you have, the more effective the measure. Um, and I think that at least a year of these lesson observations and feedback, that process getting teachers used to it and understanding that it's going to continue to improve um, before it's high-stakes is really valuable. I would use those measures and get into the professional development and coaching and those implications immediately. Um, but high stake decisions about um, you know teachers advancing and um, or moving out of a system, I think that it's important to get them used to the measures first. Um, how we're going to continue to improve, 
we're just going to keep talking to our teachers, keep talking to our principals. Um, we do annual surveys as well as informational in-person discussions frequently. Um, so we're just going to keep listening really carefully to the needs and wants of our schools. Yeah, same thing. Since this process started, we've done over 150 focus groups, spoken to over 1,500 teachers, principals, parents, community members. We will continue that process. Um, but we're also going to look at you know, interesting things that are going on. I mentioned the Gates study. Um, there's some interesting learnings there. And we're looking at what everybody else is doing. And uh, we'll continue to you know, take the best thinking and improve. And then, of course, the looking at the data itself. I think there's so much to learn by actually looking at the data, analyzing it, and improving based on the, what we're seeing in the numbers. Great.